On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. And this is About Books, Book TV's program and podcast which looks at the business of publishing. Well, in just a few minutes, we'll hear from an author who has spent most of her career trying to get readers to read other authors. But first, a U.S. Circuit judge recently blocked the planned $2 billion merger between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster. Andrew Albanese is a senior writer with Publishers Weekly, and he's followed the case from the beginning, and he joins us now. So, Mr. Albanese, remind us of what this merger was to begin with. This merger was set to be the the uh, coming together of the world's largest English language trade publisher, which is Penguin Random House, with its third largest big five rival publisher, Simon & Schuster, would have created a a mega merger, a publisher that would have been uh, roughly 49% of the market for best-selling books. So who was supporting it and who was against it? Well, supporting it, of course, were the merging parties, right? Simon & Schuster, its its, its parent company, Viacom CBS, had decided to get out of the publishing business. And Penguin Random House, uh, obviously the largest and most successful publisher right now, really wanted to pick it up. So they were the ones who were really pushing for this. Who was against it? Well, pretty much everybody in the book business was against this deal. And all eyes then turned to the Department of Justice to see whether or not they would step in to try to block the deal, which, of course, in November of 2021, they did. And what was the Justice Department's position? Really interesting here, because most times when we talk about antitrust cases, we're talking about monopoly cases that deal with potential consumer effects. The Department of Justice in this case was pursuing a monopsony monopsony claim, which is when uh, a market contracts down to one or a few buyers. In this case, the buyer was the publisher and the seller was authors who were selling rights to these publishers. Now, monopsony claims are not uncommon, but they are somewhat unusual. Usually we see uh, with an antitrust case, it's about monopoly and potential consumer prices. This was all about the market for book rights for authors. It was a very novel approach. And I think that led to a lot of people questioning whether or not this was going to be an effective uh, case for the Department of Justice. Of course, in the end, it was. Uh, the, the judge clearly bought the Department of Justice's case here and ruled for them, blocking the deal. And the Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor said after the judge ruled on this case, quote, the proposed merger would have reduced competition, decreased author compensation, diminished the breadth, depth, and diversity of our stories and ideas, and ultimately impoverished our democracy. That's a pretty strong statement. Indeed, a very strong statement, and one I think that the publishing community, particularly authors in the publishing community, have been looking for for years. Uh, The publishing industry, as Judge Florence Pan noted in her decision, is pretty highly concentrated. We have five major publishers in the industry. This would have taken it down to four. But more problematic is that it would have made one huge firm at the top of that industry, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, that combined entity. And it was that entity, the government said, that was going to have uncommon power to suppress author advances and to shove uh, potentially non-beneficial terms down authors' throats. And if authors can't make money on their books, or can't get good deals on their books, that ultimately would have an impact on all of us because we would not have the diversity of ideas out there that that we need in this country. And Florence Pan, Judge Florence Pan said in her ruling, the effect of the proposed merger may be substantially to lessen competition in the market for the U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books. We seem to spend a lot of time in this case talking about best-selling books. Exactly. And, you know, that's that's the legal standard for Judge Pan was whether or not this deal would substantially was likely to substantially lessen competition. She found that easily was. And you raised the the exact right point that we were talked in. In this case, the Department of Justice built its case on this very small subset of books. And these are books that get advances 
of over $250,000, uh, which seems like a lot, but really when you factor in how much work goes into a book, it, it's actually not that much. Uh, the publishers had argued that this is just a really small segment of the total book market, less than 2% of authors, and you know you really can't block a deal as anti-competitive based on this really small subset. But Judge Florence Pan easily saw through that, noted that while this is a small number of authors that get these advances, they account for, I think she said 70%, she found, of the revenue. Uh, these best-selling books obviously are where publishers really make their money. And if the publishers were to get so much control, these the, the combined entity, I should say, over this section of the industry, uh, it would really change the balance of power in an anti-competitive sense in the book business. And Andrew Albany is one of the celebrity people who spoke up, celebrity authors who spoke up during this trial was uh, Stephen King. That got a lot of attention. It did get a lot of attention. And, and frankly, so Stephen King didn't have a lot to say that was on point in terms of the legal case. What he did say resonated loudly, though, and, that's was, and that was consolidation in the industry is bad and it needs to be arrested. It hurts authors. And you know, it, was, it was interesting at trial, the, the defense attorney, Daniel Petricelli, uh, had no questions for Stephen King. He said, I'd love to have a coffee with you and sit down and talk about your fascinating career but I have nothing to ask you today. And that was the defense's, uh, you know, their attempt to sort of characterize King's testimony as not really pertaining to the case. But I think if you read Judge Pan's decision, there's a lengthy section in there about consolidation and competition in the book business. I think she clearly was affected by King's testimony. So what was the reaction from Simon & Schuster and Penguin Random House after the ruling? Well, a disappointment, obviously, and I really feel for the employees of Simon & Schuster, right, because they are still looking for a home more than two years later, and there seems to be, you know, no end in immediate sight for them to, to who's going to be their corporate owner. Uh, nevertheless, they've continued to put out outstanding books. Simon & Schuster's been posting record sales uh, throughout for the last couple of years and still to this day. Penguin Random House, I think it's a little more complicated. I think they would like to, I think they're considering an appeal to try to push this forward. Where that gets complicated now is that both you know Simon and Schuster and Penguin Random House have to agree to move forward together in any appeal, and you can see where Simon and Schuster would want to just move on and find a new buyer that can pass muster and be approved by the Department of Justice, whereas I think Penguin Random House would like to continue the fight and, and ultimately make Simon and Schuster uh, part of its portfolio. To use your words, why is Simon and Schuster looking for a home? I think it's, you know, it comes down to a corporate decision with Viacom CBS that publishing is not part of their core strategy for the future. Um, you know, Viacom CBS, obviously, we're looking at, you know, the age of streaming and technology and content and, and things are changing rapidly. Books are a mature industry. You know, we're not getting a, like a ton of innovation from the book business, right? We're selling books. And while books are doing very well, the market for books has been up significantly over the last couple of years. Like I said, it's, there's not a ton of growth that you're going to squeeze out of a, an industry that's, that's mature, like the book business, and not a lot of innovation to come there. So I think they just didn't see that aligning with their strategic goals and decided that it was time to move on. Well, Andrew Albanese of Publishers Weekly, thanks for the update on this case. My pleasure. And this is about books. This is Book TV's program and podcast looking at the business of publishing. And now we want to introduce you to British writer Louise Wilder. She has spent most of her career trying to get readers to buy other authors' books. She does it through blurb writing. In fact, she is so prolific, she's written a book about it, Blurb Your Enthusiasm. Book TV's John McArdle sat down with her recently to talk about her new book. Louise Wilder, what's a blurb and how important is it to a book's success? Right. Um, well, the word blurb, um, I guess, has different meanings um, over your side of the Atlantic than it does here in England. Um, it, I think in the US, it's more commonly used to describe um, an advanced endorsement that, that an author will give for another author's book, whereas here we tend to use it to mean um, 
the descriptive copy that goes on a book. So, you know, the, the synopsis, although I think it's much more than a synopsis, uh, which is why I wrote a whole book about it. Um, I think that, that the words we see on books, um, I mean, we probably read more of them than we do actual books themselves, can tell us so much about um, the history of books, about the art of words, about publishing, about storytelling, um, and the more I delved into them, the, the more fascinating things I discovered. So, um, yeah, that they and they they've been around a lot longer than we think. Um, the word blurb was in, I think it was coined. There's no evidence before then in 1907 by an American writer. Um, it was on an advert for his book. Um, called are you a bromide which means like are you a really dull person and so this whole thing is lampooning the language of literary hype um you can see the ad if you look for it online it's got a photo of a woman they call miss belinda blurb in the art of blurbing and she's saying how this book is so wonderful that it's going to make you want to crawl through miles of tropical jungle and bite someone on the neck because it's so spectacular so the whole idea is that it's just mocking this you know the puffery of publishing so i sort of think whether we use it in your sense or the the, the the sense we more commonly use it in here in England that that a blurb is definitely a piece of hype you know maybe something we don't quite trust on the history of blurbs you get into that in your book blurb your enthusiasm and one quote yeah. from George Orwell that you start your book with question any thinking person as to why he never reads novels <laughs> And you will usually find that at bottom, it is because of the disgusting tripe that is written by the blurb reviewers. Yes, that's quite strong, isn't it? <laughs> um, yes, I think it's interesting. I think in this sense, Orwell was talking a little bit more about um, blurbs in terms of a, a quotation, you know, a puff from another author. Um, but I found it interesting that when I looked into this, um, Orwell wrote uh, not long after actually writing that that in an essay he wrote to his friend Cyril Connolly asking him if he could give him a nice blurb for his book basically saying you know I'll scratch your back if, if you scratch mine so you know I think everyone's everyone's in on it um but Orwell did have quite a lot of obviously a lot of control over the words that went on his covers um there's there are some letters between um him and his his editor when they were um just before the publication of, of 1984 and he said you know I really don't like the way you've described this book it makes it sound like a thriller mixed up with a love story um and so presumably being all well he he got his own way and so his the blurb that he wrote um talks much more about totalitarianism it sets up this dystopian world um and it starts 1984 was the year in which it happened um, which I actually think is a really good hook as well. It, it gives you a sense of mystery, you know. Well, this is your first book, but you're no stranger to writing blurbs. How long have you been in the blurb business? Yeah, <laughs> the blurb business. Um, it's, <laughs> it's over, over 25 years now, so <laughs> since the last century, I guess, uh, which makes me feel very old. Um, yeah, I, I started out in publishing in the 1990s um, and things have changed quite a lot since then. Um, initially, there was a, a, dep a department of us who would just wrote the cover copy, the jacket copy for the books. That's all we did. And we read books all day and we wrote blurbs and it was just wonderful. Um, but since then, we have been kind of separated out and folded into marketing departments um which actually I, I i do think works well because you know it what we're doing in a sense is marketing to to the consumer directly you know there's probably no more direct way of doing it than the words that they will see when they browse in a bookshop and pick a book up and look at the back of it um i think people and there are a lot of estimations that people might not spend more than about 30 seconds doing this but you know hopefully something in those words that we've that we've crafted will jump out and and make them want to want to buy um yeah <laughs> <laughs> and in, in your 25 years, have they all been at Penguin Books in the UK? They have, yes. Obviously, now we're Penguin Random House in the UK. Um, but it, yes, it, it was at Penguin. Um, I've worked in various departments. So I've worked on very um, commercial books, you know, like thrillers. Um, and now I tend to work on more serious nonfiction and a lot of classics. Um, 
but I think you know it's it seems to be the same where wherever I am you know often we'll get you know we're working with that a book that might not yet be written or we'll just have a few lines about it and not know that much um you know hopefully there's a, man, a manuscript that we can get our hands on but that's not always the case um but it's yeah it's been such an instructive and amazing experience you know I've got to read incredible works of literature I've learned so much more than I ever did when I was at university about you know the art of writing and putting together a piece of writing um and I think that you know writing these very short paragraphs can actually teach you a lot about um you know writing as a whole and you know writing a whole book well what makes a good blurb (gasps) oh (laughs) the million dollar question um I would say that a blurb is a lot more than a synopsis. You know, if you want a synopsis of a book's plot, you can just look on Wikipedia. Um, The author Iris Murdoch said that a blurb is a mini art form, and that's how I like to see it. Um, It should tell a story. It should have a beginning, middle and an end. It should, that story should contain tensions and drama and mystery. It should do a, a kind of a dance between divulging and withholding. Um, it should set up, you know, a time and a place, um, but do it in a way that really hooks a reader in. You know, I think it's really important that a blurb will make an emotional connection with a reader, um, whether it's something like the the opening of the blurb on um, the first Discworld novel by Terry Pratchett. It starts in the beginning, there was a turtle, which just makes you smile, or something like um, the blurb that's been on Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale, for years, Um which starts the Republic of Gilead allows Offred only one function to breed, which obviously creates a completely different kind of emotion. It unnerves you and unsettles you. So I think a good blurb has to hook you in. It has to tell a story and it has to try and be original in some way, which is difficult when you're writing thousands of these things. But, you know, it needs to try and stay true to the book if it can and and pick out some, um, some kind of, intriguing detail from it you know i think we have a responsibility with what we do as well well how do you write a good blurb for a bad book a a book that you don't have (laughs) any emotional connection to that you're not that you're not feeling that with Mm. oh that's a good question um weirdly i think sometimes it can be easier um because you don't you're not involved so or, or you know if it's something that i'm not an expert in at all you know some science book that i know on a subject I know nothing about in a way that can be easy because I'm kind of like the layman you know I I don't have this expertise and so I can step back from something and hopefully try and make it clear try and make it accessible which is what I'm there to do and I think and I think you know perhaps with a, a novel that's not that great you know I like to be positive and think that there's always something that you can find to love in a book and it's my job to try and dig it out. <laughs> have you ever lied in a blurb? <laughs> oh well I would describe it as more of a fib maybe than a lie um you know it's it's like a, a a kind of a white lie um there's an Italian author Roberto Calasso um who I quote in the book and he talks about the art of blurbing being like introducing someone at a party you know you um you you could be talking to someone who doesn't know anything about them and so you'll concentrate on the good parts and the positives you know rather than saying this you know this person like this book is a bit kind of saggy in the middle and (laughs) rambles on a bit you know I think it's our job to try and highlight those good things and and I also think that perhaps as readers you know most readers are very savvy they're aware of what's going on and partly I think I know as a reader that I want to be hooked in um there was a quote on a book that I, I bought the book because of the quote in it on the front. And it said, if if George Clooney had walked into the room while I was reading this book, I would have sent him away. And I thought, right, I have to buy this book. And so it worked for me. And, you know, I knew that I was being manipulated. But at the same time, I just couldn't resist. Well, of course, everybody wants to know, did you write the blurb for your own book? Ah, right. Um, well, initially, um, 
as a kind of experiment, I got six uh, copywriters who I knew from from my days in publishing, um, who either still work in the industry or, or freelance, and um, we. I asked each of them to write a blurb for my book and I thought, you know, maybe the best one can go on the book because I have this theory that ideally an author shouldn't write their own blurb because you need an outsider's perspective. An author can often be far too close to the material. Um, And in the end, they were just all so great and so different that we decided to put them as an appendix at the end of the book, um, along with a blurb that I used a a kind of computer generated blurb. There's a program you can use to do them, which was just terrible and made me feel really glad that you know hopefully I'll still be in a job because computers definitely can't write blurbs at the moment um and so in the end um I did end up kind of ignoring my own advice and my editor and I worked on the blurb on my book together which actually had to be incredibly short because I've actually I've got a copy of it here um you might not be able to see but there's there's sort of that much space for the blur because I was lucky enough to get some really nice endorsements for the book as well. And so we really just had to try and imply that there was a lot in there. You know, it covers all sorts of subjects and areas, um, but just do it in this tiny space. So, yes, I, I completely ignored my own advice. <laughs> well, authors always want to read their own works. So go ahead and read out the blurb that's on the back of your book. <laughs> Oh, (laughs) you might hate it. Uh, So it says, this is the outside story of books from blurbs to titles, quotes to checks jacket, cute animal designs. This is a joke because it has a little cute mouse on the front Um, via author feuds, writing tricks, classic literature, bonk busters, plot spoilers and publishing secrets. Discover why it's good to judge a book by its cover. Maybe even this one. (laughs) For an American audience, what's a bonk buster? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's it's a little bit rude. I think they were also known as sex and shopping novels. So I think possibly a bonk buster is, is how they're known in the in the UK. So it's all those marvellous 80s, huge door stopper novels by by the likes of Jackie Collins and Shirley Comran, um, which I do go into quite, you know, there's one chapter devoted to them in my book just because they were an important part of my teenage reading experience. Well, you can't obviously have any complaints about your own blurb, but do you find in the uh, 5,000 or so blurbs that you've written in in your career, do authors like the blurbs? What, what's their relationship as, as you create these for other authors? Mm, I think it really varies. Um, I think some are incredibly protective of their work and they want to control every area of it and others are very happy to have this outsider step in. Um, but the, often, you know, that their idea of what is what will sell something and mine are quite different. That, that if, you know, a lot of authors will try and make things really long. And one wrote to me saying, you know, this blurb is so comprehensive. Nobody's going to have to buy the book now, which is completely the, you know, not our aim. Um, and um, yeah, they're, they're mostly quite reasonable. I had uh, I had a letter from John Updike which was lovely you know obviously you know quite a few years ago now um I'd rewritten the blurb for his novel Couples and um it was meant to be very short and very snappy and and it's such a charming letter he he includes the blurb that he wrote for the first edition and said you know this is this is my far less giddy attempt to describe its contents um, and at the end you know he sort of did this and then just says oh oh my have have it your way so that was a lovely <laughs> example of an author agreeing to what i'd written but you know there have been far worse instances you know some some i won't name any names but some have been pretty horrible um a friend of mine had has had you know blurbs torn up in front of him um he's had to write you know 21 different versions of a blurb um and there was the the british author Jeanette winterson who really hated the blurbs on her some um, some reissues of her backlist um novels they gave them new covers and they rewrote the blurbs at the same time and um, she hated them so much that she decided to set fire to a pile of her own books in her garden and then put it on social media, which is, I think, possibly the most extreme example of blurb hating I've come across. What are some of the other examples of, of uh, well-known books that our readers uh, might have seen that your words are on the back of? Oh, yeah. Um, I've, a lot of Penguin classics, things like that. Um, there was... 
I'm not quite sure, you know, in in how it translates to to the United States. Um, there was a novel called Alone in Berlin that did incredibly well here. It was um, became a sort of an international bestseller, and I was I was really pleased to have have worked on that book. Um, you know, a lot of the time I think that I'm, I never know if I'm that pleased to see my blurbs on books because invariably they've been changed by somebody, either an editor or an author. You know, they've always been slightly tweaked. And so I never know if I'm really 100% happy, but I'm sure that's the same with people who write anything, you know. Is it uh, true that, that J.D. Salinger wanted only his name and title on the back of his books and, and he wanted to let his books speak for themselves? Yes, it's absolutely true. Um, and, you know, delving into publishing history, nobody really seems to know why this is the case. But he had it in his contracts. They stipulated that it should only his name and the book's title should appear on the cover. Nothing else, no no information about him. So no biography and no quotes and absolutely no blurb. Um, he was notoriously publicity shy. So perhaps, you know, this was part of it. Um I also found um, the the blurb on like the original edition of um, Catcher in the Rye did have a blurb on it. This was obviously before he instigated this rule, um, and it was pretty terrible. <laughs> I wonder if that was anything to do with it. But yeah, I think it's it's gone. It's you know it's a publishing mystery, but um, but one that has been adhered to. Well, before we ended, I wanted to to get your thoughts on some of the words that stuck out to me looking through my bookshelf. Uh, reading blurbs of books that I have, these are some of the words that just kept coming up. Compelling, (laughs) refreshingly (laughs) unique, fascinating, readable, timely, intimate, (laughs) and revealing. Oh, you're so right. You're so right. Um, that readable, that's the worst one, isn't it? It's like, well, it's a book. Of course it's readable. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I feel very ashamed when I hear <laughs> things like this because I do think there is this kind of language of publishing cliche where all too often, you know, people who work in the industry will fall back on these adjectives. You know, haunting's another one. Um, and, you know, they're often kind of light references, you know, dazzling, luminous, searing. Like, you know, why do we use these words? Obviously, I try and avoid avoid using them wherever possible. And I think one rule with copy and with all good writing is to try and avoid, you know, it's the show don't tell rule, you you know, avoid just sounding like a publisher telling people why they need to read this book and why it's the most earth shattering thing that's ever, ever been written. And instead, go back to the work itself, think of something concrete from the book, you know, Orwell talked about using pictures and sensations to get your message across, which I think is far stronger than, you know, (laughs) any kind of landmark groundbreaking, (laughs) unputdownable (laughs) <laughs> all of those kind of words that we use. The book is Blurb Your Enthusiasm, an A to Z of Literary Persuasion. The author is Louise Wilder. Appreciate your time on About Books. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. And this is About Books, Book TV's program and podcast looking at the business of publishing. Well, each Tuesday, dozens of new books are published. Here's a recent sampling. Republican Senators Tom Cotton of Arkansas and Ted Cruz of Texas both have new books out about the political battles facing America today. Senator Cotton's book, which focuses on national defense and foreign policy, is titled Only the Strong, Reversing the Left's Plot to Sabotage American Power. And Senator Cruz's newest book is aimed at the judiciary and U.S. legal system. It's titled Justice Corrupted, How the Left Weaponized Our Legal System. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal senior writer John Hilsenrath is out with a new book. It's a biography of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. It's titled Yellen, the Trailblazing Economist Who Navigated an Era of Upheaval. Also each week, national publications review newly released books. Here's a couple. Daily Beast and USA Today columnist David Rothkoff's new book, American Resistance, earned a Kirkus review. Kirkus calls it a revealing book about how government professionals, the so-called deep state, kept the Trump administration from wreaking even more havoc than it did. Rothkoff, Kirkus writes, rescues the reputations of some officials, such as Kirsten Nielsen, 
Secretary of Homeland Security, while further lowering those of White House advisors Stephen Miller and Jared Kushner. And the Washington Post took a look at Linda Kintzler's new book, Come to This Court and Cry, How the Holocaust Ends. In her gripping debut, the Washington Post writes, Kintzler traces how the crimes of World War II have been prosecuted and justice attempted over generations, how memories have been formed and used, usurped and omitted. And watch for these authors and programs in the near future on Book TV. Well, thanks for joining us on About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Book TV will continue to bring you publishing news and new author programs. And to get this podcast and all other C-SPAN podcasts, go to our C-SPAN Now app. And a reminder that all Book TV programs are available to watch online at booktv.org.